Hello, um, welcome to this online seminar about anti-Semitism and the left. We're starting looking at the issue as it's affected the UK. My name's Ivor Gaber, I'm Professor of Political Journalism at the University of Sussex. And this seminar is brought to you by the Weidenfeld Institute of Jewish Studies at the university. I'm joined by two of my colleagues from there, Gideon, Professor Gideon Rafuni, Rafaini, who's director, and David Younger, who's a lecturer in history. Um, our two guests today, who are great experts in the subject, are Dave Rich, who both studies anti-Semitism, and I want to say practices it, is involved in practice against it. Um, he's, he's authored The Left Jewish Problem, Jeremy Corbyn, Israel and Antisemitism, now in its second edition, and also joined by Dr. Matt Bolton, who's a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Antisemitism Research at the Technical University of Berlin, and has been writing about this topic, particularly in a, a book um, about Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn and his politics and how it's influenced the Labour Party. It's called Corbynism, a critical approach. I wonder if we can start, Dave, by asking you to set out the scene in terms of the UK and the left's issue with anti-Semitism. Um, is it a particular problem for the UK? And if so, what's the nature of the problem? Sure, uh, and thank you for, for organizing this and for inviting me on. Um, the problem of anti-Semitism on the left in the UK obviously has become uh, such an issue and such a talking point because of what happened in the Labour Party um, during the nearly five years that Jeremy Corbyn was leader and then the legacy of that since then. And what that did was it brought a whole pack of ideas uh, and, and a whole framework for understanding the world and a whole kind of mode of political, political activism that had existed on the fringes of the left for a very long time into uh, mainstream politics, into you know, the main social democratic uh, left party in British politics, the, 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 one of the two parties of government. And it, so it suddenly became an issue uh, of interest and importance to huge swathes of people who had never paid it any attention before because previously these ideas had been just fringe cranky ideas that that would every now and again be a subject of protest by the Jewish community or, or by other people but not really of, of major political significance and they became of major political significance because Jeremy Corbyn was from this political world so um the, the first answer to your question of is this just a problem for the UK or a feature for the UK, the answer is it's a, a problem or a potential problem anywhere that these kind of fringe ideas have a gateway into mainstream politics, whether that is through their own parties or by, as happened in the UK, by taking control of an existing mainstream political party. Um, and what we saw in under Labour is that the whole question of anti-Semitism, is it a real problem, isn't it? How does it manifest? Why does it matter? Became completely entwined with the power struggles within the Labour Party as a whole. Um, and complaints about anti-Semitism, uh, complaints made by people within the Labour Party and made by people outside the party, were seen, almost reflexively seen by Corbyn and his supporters as not genuine complaints, but as actually an attack on him and his position as leader, and therefore an attack on the, his entire political project. And therefore that these complaints were not genuine, but were motivated by a desire to bring down his socialist project. Um, and so this whole idea that complaints of anti-Semitism were a smear, and that any efforts to uh, expel people from the Labour Party who were guilty of making anti-Semitic comments was, was a witch hunt. These are ideas that became really, really prevalent. Uh, ideas promoted by, by Corbyn himself and people around him all the way down to, you know, in the grassroots, these would be completely commonplace in the Facebook groups and the other social media spaces that supported uh, Corbyn's project, the kind of alt-left, new media websites like the Squawk Box and Canary that really uh, 
grew up as as the kind of the online um, kind of sources of information uh, for this movement. Uh, this idea that it was all a smear became really dominant. And what happened was, um, as the complaints about anti-Semitism became too strong to resist, um, the Labour Party went through a series of internal investigations and inquiries and reports into the issue, none of which dealt with it, uh, or none, none of which dealt with it effectively. And we don't need to go into the details of each report, but th there was one thing they all had in common. Uh, which was central to their failure to deal with it properly, is that none of them asked the question, why is this happening? They were all very procedural. They all tried to explain if we just improve this process here and, and get some more complaint staff and so on and so on. None of them really asked the political question of why are these ideas now suddenly appealing to so many people? And why do so many of these people who believe these anti-Semitic ideas think the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn is the party for them when it's supposed to be an anti-racist party? Uh, and because these, these internal inquiries never asked the right question, they never got the right answer and they never dealt with the problem. And it ended up with a situation where um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which is the the official state regulator, I mean, it's independent of government, but statutory regulator for equalities law, for anti-discrimination law, look, held an inquiry into the party and found the Labour Party guilty of unlawful discrimination against Jews, which is, a, a, I mean, an absolutely shattering finding. And this, this, this report by the EHRC was significant, not just in, in the fact of what it has said about the Labour Party and, and the practical and legal uh, implications for the party of what it now has to do to, to, um, to be lawful again in its, in its behaviour. But that report represents, uh, or is in a way the culmination of an entire kind of narrative about anti-Semitism on the left. And this is what you might consider a kind of official or mainstream narrative about anti-Semitism in the party. It's a narrative that was, I think, pretty much the consensus of most of the Jewish community during this period, that was shared by a lot of people within the Labour Party, especially a lot of Labour MPs who are more kind of centre or to the right of the party, that was um, pretty much the dominant narrative in the mainstream media, it was the narrative promoted by a very important BBC Panorama documentary and one that was endorsed by the EHRC and has been taken on by the new Labour leader, uh, Keir Starmer, right? And this is a narrative that sees anti-Semitism as a genuine problem on the left and in the Labour Party uh, and one that requires kind of legalistic solutions, if you like. And then opposed to that, you have what you might call a resistance narrative, right? And this is the narrative that was believed by Corbyn and his supporters during their time in the leadership and since then. Um, and it is the narrative that it was encapsulated really in a report that was put together by Corbyn's supporters within the Labour machine in the last few weeks and months of their time in power, which was meant to be submitted to the EHRC, but then wasn't because it was blocked by the party's lawyers. It then got leaked to the media. It was 850 pages are basically making the argument that um, all the problems of anti-Semitism in the party were uh, the result of sabotage by right-wingers within the Labour machine who wanted to make Corbyn look bad. It's, it's, it's a conspiracy theory, basically. But the point is this, um, this narrative is, is very much the, the, the argument of kind of the Labour left of the left-wing MPs in the party now, of Corbyn and his supporters, and then beyond that, the alt-left media and social media, momentum as, as a political movement. And in time with this is the idea that there is anti-Semitism, but it's been weaponized, it's been overstated. Uh, and the, real, the big problem, the real problem is racism against people of color uh, in society as a whole, in the party, and against uh, MPs of color. And you get these two competing narratives um, of whether anti-Semitism matters, right? And this plays into everything that's going on in the wider world at the moment and in progressive politics as a whole at the moment about 
how to understand anti-Semitism and the place of Jews in the wider politics of anti-racism. Uh, and particularly with everything that's happened with the Black Lives Matter movement uh, in the past year or so. Um, so for example, the, this leaked report that I mentioned contained evidence of, uh, in it of, of Labour Party staffers being incredibly rude and disrespectful towards uh, certain black Labour MPs um, in a way that was not explicitly, but certainly I think implicitly racist. And this has been seen as evidence of actually the real problem in the Labour Party is racism, not anti-Semitism. Now, interestingly, you have a third track because and this leaked... Let, let me ask you to end with your third track, Dave. I will, I will. I'll this, this is my final point. The EHRC report and this leaked report both agreed on two things. Firstly, the anti-Semitism in the party was real. It was, not a, it was not a smear and it was not made up and there was no witch hunt. And secondly, the denial of the anti-Semitism in the party is a contributing, fa contributing factor to the problem of anti-Semitism in the party. The third track is, is the people kind of outside of both of these movements who, uh, who reject all of that. These are people who've been thrown out of the party for anti-Semitism. They have a certain uh, kind of, they reside in parts of academia, actually. Uh, currently, this is circulating around a professor at Bristol University who this, who's campaigning on this, this issue. And this is the idea, the whole thing's made up. The whole thing's a smear to bring down the left. And that's the kind of the third track. So you have these three narratives about anti-Semitism on the left moving forward out of the wreckage of what happened in Labour under Corbyn. Dave, that was incredibly comprehensive. We can almost wrap up the seminar now, but I, Matt has a very interesting perspective on this from the perspective, I think of you as a political, political scientist or uh, as coming from a, a political theory background. You've used that to throw light on the issue of anti in the Labour Party. Do you want to pick up and address the issue as you see it, Matt? Um, yes, thank you. Um... Yeah, the way I've been trying to think about this recently is to try and understand, because the Corbyn moment, I think, was the, as kind of Dave um, kind of indicated, it was a culmination of a very long process, right? You can, Dave's book traces this process all the way back to the 70s, and you can trace it back even further than that to the turn of the century and the way that the left has um, thought about anti Semitism and in to a great extent, failed to understand anti-Semitism properly, failed to kind of adequately grasp um, what anti-Semitism is and how it works. And I think the Corbyn um, crisis was um, a, a real culmination of, 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 um, of that, long, that long historical process. And so I'm interested at the moment in thinking about why is it that the way that the left, or large parts of the left, understand the world that means they're unable to grasp anti-Semitism adequately? What is it about the conceptual framework that means anti-Semitism um, doesn't fit in some way? It's, it's a kind of an outlier and, and it causes them a problem. Um, and I think there are two main ways that at the moment, I think um, that cause that problem in terms of conceptualizing anti-Semitism properly. One of them is the one that Dave alludes to, which is talking about the relationship between anti-Semitism and racism. And um, there's a desire to kind of conflate the two, right? To make anti like Corbyn always says, anti-Semitism and other forms of racism, to make them identical, to say that actually we're talking about the same thing and actually that anti-Semitism is a small problem really compared with other forms of racism. Well, actually, I don't think that anti-Semitism, it clearly does share some characteristics with um, other forms of racism, but it has its own particularities, which I don't think can be reduced to... Um, um, other ways of thinking about racism. I mean, in some ways, I think all forms of racism have their own particularities. But um, so the way that a lot of the contemporary left thinks about um, racism is through the prism of whiteness. So that's very dominant at the moment. Um, um, and this notion of white privilege um, and um, kind of intersectionality and all, all of this, and, and it's linked with decolonialization de theory, all of which I think have interesting things to say and are important. But I think that the role of 
anti-Semitism and the role of Jewish history and Judaism doesn't fit neatly into those binaries of white and other or privilege and non-privilege. I think it somehow kind of escapes that um, binary. And too often you see that uh, Jews are kind of immediately associated and conflated with whiteness. They become white, essentially. And as soon as you become white, you are no longer um part of a you, you you can no really long you can no longer be considered a victim of racism you're privileged you're and 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 if as soon as jews are, are are kind of conflated with whiteness the history of persecution against uh jewish people and and, and um jewish existence kind of dropped out of sight from that from the perspective of that binary so i think that's one reason why um the left has a problem with it the other reason the other conceptual framework is one that probably goes back a bit a lot further, which is, and it's something that I wrote about in the, the article um, you mentioned, and that's thinking about anti-Semitism through the prism of class and the prism of class struggle. And this, these arguments about the relationship between anti-Semitism and class and class interests were used by certain elements of the Corbyn left. As soon as they kind of stopped denying it was a problem at all, they started saying, yes, there is. A small amount of anti-Semitism within Labour, um, but it just represents the anti-Semitism that's in society as a whole, and that anti-Semitism is essentially a form of ideology which is constructed by the ruling class as a means of dividing workers, right? So you use is a kind of ideological narrative that kind of manipulates workers and stops them seeing the true sources of their oppression, which is the capitalist class, and projects that um, kind of um, oppression and uh, onto, onto Jews and, and uses Jews as a scapegoat. Um, and that actually anti-Semitism is, is essentially a, a, is a means to another end, it's a means of covering up the true interests of the capitalist class. Now, what I find interesting about that is people often say that the left, they don't understand anti-Semitism within the left, but they, they do recognise it on the right. You know, they recognise the far right as anti-Semitism, they recognise the Nazi, neo-Nazi anti-Semitism. Actually, when it comes down to it, I'm not convinced that they do, because if you understand anti-Semitism as a form of ideology, as a kind of class narrative, as a means to an end, as a means of disguising the capitalist true interests, um, the, the concept of exterminatory anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism as an end in itself, rather than a means to something else, that it's not a cover for class oppression. It actually has its own historical weight. It has its own dynamic. It has its own independent appeal, which cannot be, uh, is not just cynically wielded by the ruling class who don't really believe it. It actually has its own appeal and its own reality. Um, that's very, that's impossible to recognize through a class instrumentalist um, perspective, because if if anti-Semitism and Jews are a useful scapegoat for the capitalist class, why on earth would you ever want to exterminate them? Why would you ever want to get rid of your convenient scapegoat? Um, and so that means in some ways that, that, that the role of anti-Semitism as an essential aspect of Nazism, um, really far right, far right fascism, and um, that the role of the particular motivation, uh, motivatory role played by anti-Semitism in, in the Nazi genocide and the Holocaust is lost through a class instrumentalist um, a, a approach. Now, and that's interesting because then again, on both sides through the kind of whiteness thing and the class instrumentalist on both sides, the, the, the true historic reality of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic persecution of Jews and the attempt to kind of, you know, annihilates Jewish existence off the face of the earth, drops out of sight. Um, and why that is important in terms of the contemporary left and Corbyn and, and other ones is because if you don't understand the reality of genocidal um, anti-Semitism and, and the history of that, what that does is it, it's it, when you're thinking about Israel and the founding of the state of Israel is that it severs the founding of Israel from anti-Semitism. From you, you, you lose that kind of relation that what I've kind of described as like an intrinsic relationship between anti-Semitism and the founding of Israel. Now there is more to Israel than 
anti-Semitism, right? I know there's plenty of other aspects of, 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 of the history of, of Zionism and the idea of, of Israel, but the notion of Israel as a kind of life raft and, and a, as a defense against anti-Semitism is a crucial aspect of, of, of um, the, the state of Israel, but that's one that's completely not able to be grasped through either through the class instrumentalist viewpoint or the kind of white privilege um, viewpoint. And so what happens is for someone like Corbyn, rather than looking at Israel through the prism of anti-Semitism, he can only see anti-Semitism through the prism of Israel. So that for him, anti-Semitism is always just a kind of response to something that Israel has done. It's a response to the existence of Israel. And so Israel becomes the problem rather than anti-Semitism. So I think for me, those two aspects kind of combined, uh, they, they, I, I think they kind of underpinned the kind of history of, of, of this problem. And I don't think, I do think, I do think the UK has a particular issue with this. I think Robert Vistrich once described Britain as being a kind of pioneer in this stuff, particularly around Zionism and Israel. And I think that's definitely true, as Dave's shown in his book. But I think those conceptual frameworks are broader than that. And I think they're shared by a much wider um, left beyond, beyond the UK. A significant number of the most prominent people who have been either accused or who campaign on this issue are themselves Jewish. Um, and to an outsider, that's could be evidence that well, actually maybe this whole issue is got up because look here are Jewish people saying it's not a problem. Um, I don't know Matt or Dave if you wish to respond to that I hope you do because that's you, you've heard that many times. Dave. Uh, I've heard that many times yes and uh, look you have to understand what's going on with the kind of the the Jewish politics, the wider politics, and the interplay between them, right? There's been a tradition of Jewish uh, anti-Zionism for as long as there has been Zionism. And for a large part, for a long, a long period, in the early decades of Zionism, uh, Jewish um, resistance or opposition to Zionism was, was stronger than support for it. And that then shifted over time. And this was at a time before Israel existed, when, um, you know, before the Holocaust. And there were really intense debates within the Jewish world about what the best uh, strategy was to deal with and overcome uh, anti-Semitism. Was it assimilation? Was it Zionism? Was it socialism? Uh, and, and then there were religious, there were the, religious resistances to, to Zionism on theological grounds and so on. Now, events change things, right? There's a saying in football, goals change matches, right? Well, in, in politics, you know, events change things. The creation of the state of Israel changes things. The Holocaust changes things. The, the utter destruction of the Jewish civilization of Poland and Eastern Europe and Consequent to that, the growth of a new Jewish civilization in Israel, a new Ju Jewish culture in Israel, changes things. It changes the parameters of this debate. It changes the meaning of the political arguments. You know, the 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 uh, an, an anti-Zionist argument today has a very different meaning from what it had in 1920s. So people on, on the kind of the Jewish left, the Jewish anti-Zionist left who take those old kind of Bundist arguments from 1920s Poland and try and transplant them into the Labour Party of, of the modern day. It's, 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 a, it's really, it's a foolish conceit to imagine that it will play out in the same way, it can't. And what you have is you have a, a, a Jewish anti-Zionism, which is, is not just resistant to Israel or opposed to Israel, but is expressed in a way that is intensely hostile to much of the mainstream of the Jewish community and many of the mainstream Jewish organizations in the Jewish community in this country, because mainstream of the Jewish community in this country sees the existence of Israel as a pretty important part of their Jewish identity. And this repeated opinion polling shows us this right there is put the politics to one side just you know the, the the heart and the center of gravity of the jewish community is attached to israel right then what you have is this small number of old 
radical Jewish anti-Zionists who have no audience within the Jewish community for their views, no pickup really. But on the broader left, they do. Right. So they bring the broader left into what used to be an internal Jewish political argument, but that takes on a completely different characteristic when it's some non-Jewish conspiracy crank in, you know, on Facebook going on and on and on about Zionists behaving like Nazis. This has that has a completely different meaning and it transforms the nature of the of the politics. Um, and so, so, but you're absolutely right that the consequence of this has been that a lot of the, the energy uh, behind a lot of the anti-Semitic narratives and the anti-Semitic politics in the Labour Party have come from Jewish activists on the, on the left of the party. Um, and, but then the language gets taken up by others and it has an impact you know, beyond that kind of internal, that old internal Jewish argument um and what also happened is this is my my final point on this that section of that very small slice of jewish anti-zionist activism deliberately and consciously obstructed any kind of building of bridges between the mainstream jewish community and the labor party under jeremy corbyn because they are hostile to the board of deputies and the jewish leadership council and cst and so on they don't want their friends on the left to make you know break bread and make friends with with the mainstream of the community because they're their friends they're their allies um so they were a huge part of the problem both politically and in terms of the ideas as well matt do you wish to comment on that i think there's yes i think dave's right there's two levels of debate there's there's a kind of if you like a more of an internal uh, debate within the jewish community but then the way that certain figures get used by non-Jewish people to justify all sorts of arguments, um, I think becomes, um, it, it is a real problem. And again, that's not just unique to the UK either. I've seen that happen in, in the US and you get some quite extreme, um, you know, extreme theories that, um, that the fact that they come out of the mouth of someone who, you know, identifies as Jewish or is Jewish kind of gives them a form of legitimation and it kind of enables non-Jewish people, gives them permission to say things that I think in other, in other circumstances they might um, have second thoughts about. Uh, you mentioned various um, kind of movements which, which uh, border to uh, Corbyn mo- uh, um, momentum and so on. And I would just want to, to ask these questions because Dave, you and your you and your book describe um, the, uh, the 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 anti-Semitism uh, of the Corbyn camp as coming uh, a long way, uh, forty years back, to the young liberals and a certain liberal background. And I ask, I, I wonder, are there more forces within this uh, kind of this kind of liberal movement within the Labour Party or beyond the Labour Party, which are uh, um, uh, today uh, maybe in uh, affected uh, or uh, otherwise uh, involved in in, in, a, in a rising anti-Semitism, whereas you, Matt, has uh, rather mentioned or has rather focused on uh, radical left-wing anti-Semitism in a in a certain form of a, I would say, kind of a, a, a distorted Marxism, which uh, is a play in which which uh, the Corbyn camp uh, could rely on. So you look at a kind of a it seems to me a certain, uh, a different camp, uh, different political uh, movements. But uh, the question to the two of you, how widespread, how broad is anti-Semitism and where uh, left being anti-Semitism and where are the, um, yeah, the, the allies, uh, so to speak, of this particular kind of Corbyn anti-Semitism right now in the UK after he has left? Look, in, in terms of this, this, um you know, are we talking about kind of liberal left ideas or more radical Marxist politics? Uh, I think they've both had an influence. And I think one thing I think that that comes out of this is you can almost um, map them to a certain extent onto the difference between pro-Palestinian activism and anti-Zionism. And I think the the pro-Palestinian activism is... uh, 
much less likely to move into anti-Semitism than the anti-Zionism, which by nature is more abstract and ideological and which actually tends to come from those kind of Jewish anti-Zionist sources as well. Um, in terms of how widespread this is, the, the um, it depends which aspect we look at. Look, there are kind of common sense assumptions about Jews that have been pretty widespread not just on the left, but across kind of broad liberal opinion for a very long time. And you can go all the way from just basic stereotypes of associating Jews with money and power and so on into a kind of um, sort of knee jerk uh, association of Israel with uh, kind of American power and wrongdoing and militarism. And it just fits in that box of the oppressors and the network, global networks of power that then can very quickly slip into conspiracy theories and so on. Um, and associated with this, you have, this comes back to this idea that the anti-Semitism in labor was a smear. Um, and that then also brings in conspiracy theory ideas about who is it who's weaponizing this anti-Semitism and why they're doing it. Now, you know, there were a few opinion polls while Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party and shortly after he left, which suggested about a quarter of the membership bought into at least some of this. Um, I don't know if that's still the case. I think these are these are very kind of loose and fluid ideas um, and they sort of flow in and out of the party. The, the issue when Corbyn was leader was not necessarily numbers of people. Um, it was the fact that this was the dominant set of ideas. These were, this, these were the kind of common sense ways of in relating to Jews and Jewish issues like Israel, Zionism, anti-Semitism and the Holocaust that were held by the leadership and their supporters. And therefore, they were the dominant views in um, kind of the Facebook groups and the CLP meetings and just in the party and in the left as a whole. Now, the leadership has changed, the tone of the party has changed. It, this doesn't have a, the same kind of purchase. So it will flow out and it will find a new home elsewhere, whether that's in academia, where a lot of this has come from anyway, in trade unions. You know, this is this, this is a reservoir ideas that will kind of ebb and flow into and out of importance depending on where the energy and, 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 and the kind of the dominance, the, di the discursive dominance lies. Matt, do you want to chip in? Certainly when I was growing up from the north, throughout the noughties, you know, from the, you know, my, from, from, yeah, from, from, from around the time of the Iraq war, um, so 2001, 2002, up into 2015, I think a lot of the, a lot of the kind of Corbyn, esque ideas around Israel in particular, um, ideas that come, were kind of expressed through the Stop the War Coalition that were tied to the campaign against Iraq, um, were extremely dominant and not just within the kind of hardcore Trotskyist or ex-Trotskyist left. I think it was much more prevalent, just as prevalent within the liberal left as a whole. If you re go through and read the stuff that The Guardian has been writing about Israel for the past 20 years, The Guardian is the kind of, you know, um, embodiment of the, the liberal left in the UK. Um, a lot of it is the same stuff that Corbyn comes out with, right? He, he, Seamus Milne was the, you know, he was the the, the, the editor of uh, Comment is Free and Guardian for 10 years and was publishing Osama bin Laden and, you know, all sorts of stuff. So I think that, and you think of people like um, Jenny Tong was, is a liberal, was a liberal member of the House of Lords, who is, I mean, not outright anti semite really, really quite extreme, even more explicit than, than Corbyn. Um, so I think that for a lot of the liberal left, this was a kind of, just a, those positions, particularly around Israel and Zionism, and, and, and then the idea that Jews were somehow raising questions of anti-Semitism as a means of kind of defending Israel, um, that kind of thing was quite prevalent for, 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 for over the last 20 years. Um, and I think, and, and of course, there's anti-Semitism on the right of British politics, as, as there is across, as there is, a, you know, um, across the political spectrum. But there was that very particular strand. Where it is now is an interesting question because I do wonder, in my more, you know, optimistic moments, I do think the fact that this conversation has now happened and we've had these five years of 
very intense interrogation of anti-Semitism. In some ways, I do wonder whether there are aspect parts of the liberal left who may be less likely to kind of just adopt those perspectives and without thinking about it reflexively. Um, in my more pessimistic moments, I think that there's actually quite a lot of people who um, have come out of the other end of the Corbyn movement and have been radicalised in some ways, actually, um, and are saying things about the, the Board of Deputies, for example, Jewish communal bodies, directly saying things about them, um, accusing them of sabotage and all this kind of stuff. And it's not no longer couched in the language of Zionism or Defence of Israel. It's direct attacks on Jewish communal um, organisations in the UK. Now, how many of those people exist? Where they go next? I don't know. But I'm interested in that. And I, I think that's a potential, that is a potential problem. I mean, the other thing in, in terms of contemporary anti-Semitism um, is a lot of the kind of COVID conspiracy thing. And in, in uh, Corbyn, there's an element of that conspiracy worldview, which Corbyn himself, I think, kind of, Ad adheres to you know i think i think he buys into a lot of stuff about all sorts of different conspiracies i mean he's his brother is even even worse right but uh, you know you, you don't want to unite the two but th th there's that really kind of extremes it almost crosses over into really right-wing conspiracy theory stuff um and now i don't know what the how much movement there is from the corbyn movement ex corbyn supporters moving into a kind of more broader conspiracy theory um, worldview in terms of other other aspects and how much of anti-Semitism plays a role in that. But I do think that's an interesting dynamic that's worth certainly worth keeping an eye on. Gideon, would you like to ask a question? Thank you, Matt. I'm kind of curious to know or you know to hear what's your thoughts about this because Matt, you kind of suggested that for instance one of the uh, outcomes of, of these debates is actually radicalization of some parts of the of the uh, of the labor movement so are we moving on now or what we're going to see in the in the coming years is a, some kind of a new labor which will have you know these kind of type of, of views even even more pronounced that we can say that you know this is something that you know can connect with uh, a new left a new right as well on the on the the latter one about the potential left-right crossover. I mean, it's yes, yeah, so I think it's quite, it's very, it's very interesting because those movements are, do exist in the UK. Um, I don't know if they're quite as strong as, as they are in Germany, but we have anti, there's been anti-lockdown protests over the last few days and stuff. Um, and, you know, I, and, and Corbyn himself, as, as, I, was, as I said, he, he comes from that kind of, you know, I wouldn't call it, it's not Marxian, his analysis of the world at all. It's it's conspiracy, it's capitalism as conspiracy. You know, he, you know the, the, the famous mural that he kind of complained that why it was being wiped wiped away with the guys sitting around the table counting money over the bent body the bent over bodies of workers and it was all conspiracy theory mural. Now that that he he doesn't he himself I don't think has a has a really proper grasp of what capitalism is and how it works and he understands the world as, as a very simple in a simplistic way of you know evil elites kind of controlling the mass of people through ideological ma manipulation now that worldview um i think was was quite prevalent within within the corbyn movement and um, certainly within the 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 kind of alt media um um, channels so things like the canary i think the editor of the canary appeared with went on the david ike show um at, at some point in the past and and th th so there is that kind of conspiratorial element of it um there's other parts of the the core movement who i think are much more resistant to that kind of thing and i think i'm I, I, i'm not sure they would and like john mcdonald who is the shadow chancellor under corbyn um He's, he's he's just as bad as Corbyn on anti-Semitism, but he's much, he comes from a much more genuinely Trotskyist background that has an actual analysis of capitalism. So I'm not sure that he would people in his tradition would end up merging. The other the other aspect of of the left right crossover with Corbynism is about foreign policy, um, and particularly around um, approaches to Russia, approaches, approaches to Putin, approaches to um, ideas around Syria. Um, and Assad and conspiracy theories around 
Assad and Syria and chemical weapons. I mean, that relates again to um, the professor at Bristol that Dave was talking about. So that's another space for potential left right crossover there. So I definitely think there's, there's the potential for that. Um, to what extent it actually, I mean, it's still, it's still to be determined. I, 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 but I do think that potential exists. Mm. Um, look, firstly, on that point about the kind of blurring of right and left, the, the conspiracy world is exactly where that happens. And social media makes it much easier for that to happen. You know, we um, just over a year ago, we uh, published a, an investigation into a conspiracy network called Keep Talking, which we did jointly with, with Hope Not Hate. And this was a group of conspiracy theorists that would meet once a month in central London. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn's brother was one of them. And you would literally have people who'd been thrown out of the Labour Party for anti-Semitism in the same room with Holocaust deniers and neo-Nazis and all talking about whatever the latest conspiracy theory that month was. And it's, 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 it's like a, a solvent. Conspiracy theories is a solvent that just removes the, the sort of normal barriers between right and left and the normal kind of definitional borders of these movements and just merge, mixes it all up. And the fact that conspiracy theories have definitely proliferated over the last year during the pandemic has, has accelerated that process. Um, in terms of the other question about the more general impact of anti-Semitism in, in labor and in, in wider society. Um, so this is where I think we can be a bit more optimistic um, because it definitely um, resonated in the way we would hope in wider society. Look, Britain is a country where most people do not really know any Jewish people. Most people, uh, I think half of people in one poll didn't even know what the word anti-Semitism meant. Um, most people in this country never really think about Jews or anti-Semitism. It's not a part of, it's never really been part of Britain's national story in the way that it is in France or the United States or certain other countries. And yet when it became an issue, uh, in 2019, in the run-up to the general election, it became very clear that um, that there was a general sense amongst voters that this was just not right. This was, and it, it fed into other negative perceptions of Jeremy Corbyn. It didn't really stand on its own, but there was definitely a sense from in in polling and focus groups and coming things that were coming back from the doorstep from canvassers and and, and campaigners. That anti-Semitism kept getting brought up by people who'd never thought of it before, but who just understood it was wrong. Uh, and in that respect, I think we can be reassured that in broader society, these ideas, if they're exposed for what they are and people understand what is going on um, in terms of what anti-Semitism actually is, these ideas actually don't find that much support in broader society. And I think we can be optimistic about that. It suggests to me that this um, manifestation of anti-Semitism in the last few years um, was only tapping on something that was already there. And although Corbyn and his supporters are no longer in power and the current leadership of the Labour Party is making great efforts, um, I'm concerned, A, that that issue will still, will, will still be there on the left. And B, therefore, that Jews who generally voted, not generally voted Labour, but more Jews voted Labour than didn't, won't really ever return to the Labour Party, or at least not, you know, not in the foreseeable future. So I'm trying to put a, 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 a historical perspective and looking forward a longer term than just Corbyn. And I wonder, um, Dave and then Matt, if you want to react to that. Well, I completely agree with you. The Israel-Palestine as an issue generates uh, an emotional response in parts of the left that is just qualitatively different um, from most other issues. Uh, and in a way that I, I think is frightening for a lot of Jewish people. And again, this comes back to the question of, of why and not enough people, I think, on the left ask the question, why does it trigger such a different type of response? Um, the, there's no doubt that the experience of the Corbyn years uh, was very damaging for just the image of the Labour Party within the Jewish community, but Jewish voting patterns have been changing since, since the 1970s and 1980s, really. 
um, to kind of move away from labor. So you could argue it, it accelerated an existing process, but it, it, if you, you know, if you compare Jewish voting rates for labor under Corbyn compared to, you know, just a decade earlier, really, there was a very stark difference. Um, I'm, um, again, I'm more optimistic. I think that Labour is able to win those votes back under the right leadership uh, and with the right policies. But I think it's th th they've got a big job on their hands. You know, the, the job of turning around what happened in the party under Corbyn, not just with anti-Semitism, but in so many other ways in the culture of the party, is going to take a very long time. It's, 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 it became quite a deep-rooted problem very quickly. Um, uh, but I do think the two things go hand in hand. You know, winning back Jewish voters will go hand in hand with winning back voters full stop. It is definitely true that there's that, that when Israel and Palestine is mentioned, there's a visceral reaction, right? And and you can and you can see the 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 the, the, the kind of importance, the symbolic importance that's placed on the Israel-Palestine conflict is just extraordinary, right? It's almost given this kind of cosmological importance it's like you know it's it's like the end of the world is everything rests on this 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 conflict and i mean to understand that i think you have to trace the history of anti-semitism back you know two thousand years really i think i think you're, that's part of the you know um there's there's definitely elements of of, of kind of that that old, um traditional christian anti-semitism which i think get replicated um in strange and ever-changing ways um uh, with, within the left, um, I think I think part of the problem is that I'm still not convinced that within the actual left that this conversation and self-examination, if you like, is taking place. I think there's Starmer and there's the MPs and there's the the people who you know who are in charge. I think I think they understand the problem and they want they want to sort it out. Within the left itself, I'm still not convinced that a proper self-critique of how this has happened and and the development a trace and development of this and kind of really going back to the basics of how the left understands the world and how the left understands anti-semitism i'm not convinced that's taken place and so i still think i can i can foresee at some point in the future something like this happening again perhaps in a different way um because i still don't think the underlying issues have really been grasped by the by the left the left itself which is to the detriment of, of the left Right, it's not just bad for for Jewish people that the left doesn't come to, hasn't come to terms with these problems. It's bad for the left, um, and and I'm not sure that Starmer doing that is going to solve the problem. The left has to cut, and, and leftists, and not just Jewish leftists, non-Jewish leftists have to really come to terms with what's happened and and um, uh, work through these these problems and work through these histories um, in order to 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 um, to ensure it doesn't happen again. So on behalf of the Institute, uh, let me thank David and Gideon for their questions, but particularly Matt Bolton, Dave Rich, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.